special privilege for us to have you here and join us. And I hope you'll join us at other, oh, other okay. coming up. Thank you. Uh, the uh, St. John Academy is, uh, this is our final session for the uh, autumn term. And then we'll be off uh, through the Christmas holidays and so on, resuming again in March. Uh, and uh, in March we will have a survey of the Old Testament with uh, Pastor Caney uh, reviewing each, each book of the Old Testament and telling us the theme and the most important thing of those. And of course, as you know, and we've talked about many times before, uh, the Old Testament is relative, relevant to us, not relative, but relevant to us, uh, because that's the book that Jesus knew, or the teachings of the Old Testament of the Torah. And um, as I've mentioned to you before, Jesus didn't know the New Testament at all because the New Testament was written after Jesus' death. So he would have known the what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, um, and he would have certainly uh, been a, as the Scriptures tell us, that he appeared in the temple and made a, a marvelous explication of one of the texts of the of the Torah, and so we know that Jesus was schooled in the rabbinic tradition, often called rabbi, as you know, and rabbi meaning teacher. So uh, to have a kind of uh, foundational knowledge of the Old Testament uh, improves our knowledge of the teachings of the New Testament. So I think, although some of you were here when we did that survey uh, several years ago when Pastor Camphius did it. He just picked out themes of the Old Testament, which was really good. Pastor Caney will actually take each book of the Old Testament and look at them in context. So it's, it's going to be a very good course. That'll be in March. So again, as I mentioned last time, put down Tuesdays of March uh, for Academy uh, for the uh, winter. We call it the winter term. Uh, and then the spring term will be in May every Tuesday during May, so if you'll put those down, that would be good. And Ray, I'll call on you to, Deacon Ray, to give us our opening prayer for the day. Let us pray. We thank thee, Heavenly Father, for all the good things that you have given us through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Our Father, please forgive us of our sins, both known and unknown and guide us on a straight and narrow pathway to your heavenly kingdom. And dear Lord, if it be your will, please protect us all, our friends, our fellow men, and everyone from the evil one who lurks in every corner of this world. Guide us, protect us, and give us the strength and the courage to do thy will and follow your ways. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. He's also our cameraman, as you know. Uh, a funny thing happened last time, uh, if you've seen the uh, tape on YouTube, um, the, uh, the second part, the second half after our break, I apparently, when I when I turn, either turned off the camera for our break or turned it back on, uh, it, I moved it down the camera. So it, it yeah. I just barely I, my glasses appear, but I have no forehead. <laughs> so anyhow, but the lecture the lecture is okay. So you'll watch that. So tonight, uh, hopefully, I'll have uh, more. Uh, you know. Uh, you can say, I wonder what he looks like above his glasses. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, yeah, do you have your syllabus? Everybody have your syllabus, a worksheet that we have? Yeah. And we'll, we'll be looking at that. We're working down, uh, as you know, in that worksheet uh, on the page two. Uh, and we were down into uh, the call last time. So we're down to ten. And we'll be continuing to work down through the sheet. And we have some more copies if you'd like a copy uh, of that. This is the same. Back at the registration desk, yeah. we have extra copies. I might say also uh, that the, uh, the book uh, is, uh, is a terrific resource. And as I was talking with Richard tonight, I wanted to suggest to you that this would be an excellent book uh, if any of you lead uh, a small group. In your, in your parish, in your church, 
uh, it may be an excellent resource for you to do a small group discussion because it's extraordinarily readable. It's really uh, self-explanatory in many ways, and so uh, I'd suggest that. And I was telling Richard that if you do that, we certainly can procure copies of it for you at the discount prices that we get through our distributor. And so we, if you're interested in that in your own parish church, uh, we could uh, secure copies of the book for you through, through our through the St. John book uh, store. Well, uh, we're talking about, as you know, a sanctification. That is how to live a godly life. Throughout the scriptures, uh, we're all called to, to make this earthly journey significant. Um, we started with, of course, the, the concept that we are made in the image of God, and that image is implanted in us that we share certain elements of the divinity. So you could say, in a way, that we are both human and divine. More human than divine, and uh, we are obvious that in the sins and errors of our lives. But we do share a divinity, and that divinity is then worked out in this earthly life. We made mention of the fact that God's work is not done with creation, and that while he did the, God created all the heavens and earth and everything that is in it, God also took a rest, looking back over his creation, and said, well, this is really good. I, li I like what I've done. I've done a good job. So I, in a certain humorous way, God's patting himself on the back and saying, not bad, not bad, didn't do too bad. But then he creates the human beings as the highest of the creation, and then bestows upon human beings the commission that human beings would then be the masters of creation. So he very specifically in Genesis speaks about, now go and be fruitful and multiply, and then as you follow out through the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, and particularly as you get into Exodus, you see that God continues to journey with human beings in all the kind of human endeavors. In, in achieving the promised land, uh, rescuing uh, the children of Israel from the, the uh, uh, slavery of Egypt. And in other words, you see a God who is enormously and uniquely engaged, um, not at all like the gods that were projected in the ancient world, that were gods that were specific to a specific text. You would have a God, for example, that would be the God of the harvest, and you would have Thor, you know, the god of thunder and lightning, and you'd have god of war, and you had god of this. But the genius of the Judaic, Christ, you know, Judaic Christian concept of monotheism is the idea that one god is master over everything. So there is nothing under heaven and earth that God isn't intimately involved with, knowledgeable of, and through human beings engaged in his creation. We certainly don't have a God that is like a sort of deistic concept of God, where God simply makes the world or makes the universe uh, like a, I used to use that illustration of like the Big Ben clock. I don't know whether you're old enough to remember the big, that you had to wind up. Now everything's digital and electronic. But there was a day, believe it or not, when we actually had to wind something up. Uh, including, remember the wristwatches where you had to wind them and you'd, you'd look at your watch and it'd be five hours behind you realized you forgot to wind it. But uh, the concept of sort of a deistic concept of God was the idea that God made everything and then simply withdrew and was, was not to be seen thereafter. It was kind of a once and for all event and whatever happened, happened. But the genius of this Judaic uh, uh, Hebrew concept of God, starting with, of course, the, the Jews, the, the people of Israel, is this great concept of monotheism. That is, one God who creates everything and then doesn't leave the creation to sort of happenstance, but is becomes, and this is so unique to Judaism and Christianity, that God then becomes so intimately concerned with and connected with the everyday affairs of human beings. So that's where you get those scriptures in the New Testament says that not even, uh, you know, that kind of gets kind of personal. Ray and I know about that when he talks about not a hair of our head is counted, you know. 
I'm making it easier for God, so are you, Ray, <laughs> to count the hairs. Uh, but, or not a sparrow falls from heaven that God doesn't know about. In other words, it's, it's what it's pointing out to you is there's nothing in under heaven and earth that God is not intimately involved with. And now we come down, personalize that, and say that means that God is intimately interested in the activities of my life from the beginning of my life to the end of my life and beyond. Now you see, life is a full uh, continuum. I'll be talking about this Sunday when we, we're talking All Saints Sunday, which is a Sunday in which we remember those who have gone before us. But I wanted to make the point tonight, which I'll be making more thoroughly on, on to, in Sunday, is the point that life begins with God, continues with God throughout our earthly life, and doesn't end with death, but continues through death into life everlasting. So there is never a time in which we are not intimately connected with the God who has made us, dreamed us, and loves us to the extent that, like a good parent, he's always concerned. And when I use he, understand I'm using that just sort of the way we kind of use reference, but of course God is male and female, God is everything, so uh, he's not an old man with a beard. Uh, but, but God is that power of the universe which is uh, conceived us. Psalm 139, which I've often quoted, even in my mother's womb he knew my name. That is, that I was not an accident of birth, neither were you. You were all designed, created, dreamed up by God, and then sent to earth for a specific mission to fulfill, as we pray in the Lord's Prayer, to bring the kingdom of heaven on earth. So we not only are loved by God forever, in the beginning before we were born, through our mother's womb and in birth, through this entire life, through, the, the, through death, and that's why in the great 23rd Psalm we can say, Though we walk through the valleys of the shadows of death, we will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Meaning, there is no place, no time, no circumstance that God is not intimately there with your life. As, as younger people say, he's a 24-7 God. Now, sometimes he's very close to us in our awareness. And then other times we find kind of a distance, like, you know, I've, I'm, I'm not as intimate or I don't feel his presence. But that doesn't mean that he's not there. As we said last night, or last time, very much like a parent. You send your, parent, your kids off to college, you can't be there in the dorm room, you can't be there in the classroom, but they're never out of your mind and your concern and your prayers. Ask any parent that has children and they say, I pray for my children every day. I wish them well. If there's anything I can do, I will be there to help. Same with God. So that then we have this, this where we've established the, the fact that human life is not an accident, that it has purposefulness, and it has uh, responsibilities. Now, once we have a sense that God has made us, created the universe for us, because remember, he makes the creation, then he rests, then he puts us in charge, meaning that we are, have an obligation to try to discover in our lives what the objective is for our living. In other words, what is my purpose? What does God have for me to fulfill, and how am I going to fulfill it? And part of this answer to that question is, is this journey of faith. Because as we make the journey of faith, we're guided by Jesus and his teachings. That's where Jesus comes in. That he becomes our coach, our mentor, our rabbi, our priest, our pastor, to kind of point us in the right directions. He does it in the rabbinic style. The rabbinic style is to, to tell a story uh, so that we draw a conclusion. Notice in the New Testament, every time Jesus appears, there's a teaching. It's not, you know, no details about the sort of mundane things like, 
we don't see that Jesus goes to McDonald's for a cup of coffee, he puts his feet up on the chair. Uh, you know, we don't have all those things, you know, that he uses Pepsi and toothpaste. I mean, all the concerns that we could have regarding our lives are irrelevant. I mean, there's no, nothing ever mentioned about where he lives, a house, never any mention of possessions, never any, but it's always focused on teaching and conveying something that he wants you to learn. So every time you encounter Jesus, there's a message there for you. And the intention, of course, is that Jesus comes to help us what does he say? To show us the way, the truth, and the life. In other words, so Jesus becomes a critical uh, element in this whole mystery of, of God's creation and the intent God has for us living our lives. Now the wisdom of the centuries, through the teachings of the rabbis, through the ancient texts, the holy scriptures, through the teachings of Jesus, uh, focuses us on what it means to live this godly life and what it means to, to fulfill uh, God's purposes for our living. And some of the things we've been talking about lead us in that direction. So we're now down on, we finished with call, number 10 on your list. And I made reference last time to the fact that you need to really come to grips with the fact that everyone in this room Every human being is called by God for a specific task, for specific tasks, plural S, and to lead the godly life. Uh, clergy are called in a specific way, but we probably should have a, a service of call for every member of the congregation. So whether you're a teacher, whether you're a, uh, a bus driver, whether you're a physician, whether you're an attorney, whether you're a janitor, whether you're, uh, you know, whatever your occupation is, a musician, a, you know, a, a, a parent, a, a friend, that's a call. A call to be a good friend. Uh, how about just the call to be a good citizen of the nation? How about the call to be a good friend and, and neighbor? How about the call to just be a good human being, if we're sort of getting down to the nitty gritty? Meaning that we all are called by God to fulfill his divine plan in this life. Now, sinfulness is the stumbling block because of our own uh, free choice, which God also gives us the ability to make good choices or the ability to make bad choices is, is critical because God is depending on us to take all this appraised wisdom, all the teachings of Jesus, all the teachings of the prophets, all the Torah, all the great writings, and, and his presence with us to try to lead us to make good choices. But sadly, sometimes we make bad choices. Now remember I've said that even in times when we make bad choices, God doesn't kick us out. God may be very frustrated, as we are with our kids, uh, sometimes when they make terribly bad choices. But a good parent will always be there to try to turn their lives around. That's called repentance, uh, to change, to change or to repent or to put yourself back on the straight and narrow, so to speak. All this business is concerned with sanctification, becoming more and more godlike, becoming more and more a mirror through which people see Jesus in us, and less and less of people being able to, to say that, you know, that, in, in other words, more and more that we begin to separate ourselves from everybody else so that people do see that we have something that they want. You know, these people are so good, and, I, you know, I, I just can't believe, you know, uh, everybody's smiling and happy, and, and everybody is, uh, you know, uh, generous and uh, always willing to help you and so on. And so when you see people like that, you understand that they are becoming more and more godlike. Now, a person on the contrary that is hostile, angry, uh, backbiting, gossipy, uh, tearing people down, 
wishing ill for people, trying to get ahead at somebody to the cost of somebody else, obviously those are not godlike qualities. You wouldn't expect God to be doing those kind of things. And so when you see people that operate in those kind of manners, you know that they are far from that image of God being reflected. In other words, their journey towards sanctification needs a lot of work. So given the choice between being a person that needs a lot of work and somebody that is beginning to achieve godlike qualities, and I think any rational person would say, I want to be like them. I want to be so that people say, I love to be in their presence. I feel so much better when I'm there. They are really saints in the best sense of that word. Or someone that you can always turn to and know that you'll get a, a good reception. Doesn't mean that they'll always agree with you, but they'll be willing to listen to you and to consider your point of view. And they are teachable. Godly people are teachable. They do not have it all made. They are not so egocentric that they believe that the world turns on them. Um, you know, narcissism, you know, that I'm the greatest, I'm the best, nobody can compare to me. Uh, I have all the answers, I can do anything. No, you want to see people that, that have a sense of humility and say, I can learn something and you've taught me something by the way you live and hopefully the way I live, I teach you something too. So, the call is important. Now, now let's move on to 11. Comforting hospitality. One of the greatest teachings of the, of the Holy Scriptures, the Hebrew Bible, is on hospitality, believe it or not. And the great story about Abraham. Abraham uh, became the, the father of the nation. And uh, as part of the covenant that God establishes with Abraham, Abraham uh, bears the circumcision, which was the mark of the Abrahamic covenant. Abraham, in that day, now, you know, the, the, this should probably be off camera, but, but anyhow, at this point, Abraham has to circumcise himself. And that would not be a pleasant thing. So Abraham is now sitting, the Bible tells us, sitting in front of his tent. And no doubt he's nursing his, his injury and the pain, you know, before Oxycontin or whatever. <laughs> and it's interesting that God appears to Abraham. And so God there makes the first hospital visit, or the first uh, patient call. At the very time, and this is so interesting, and the rabbis point this out, the very time that God appears to Abraham, as Abraham's sitting in his tent, probably nursing the, the pain and trying to recover, and God makes this comforting call, just at that time, some strangers appear. And Abraham jumps up and runs over to the, to the strangers and welcomes them <coughs> and extends hospitality said, well, your journey has been long. Come, come, come and stay with me for a while. Get some rest and get some shelter in my tent. And, and we'll have some food and so on. Come, come. Forgetting his own pain and his own concern. Right there was an interesting story about thinking about other people first, even though, you know, how you can get, so all you think about is yourself. You know, my needs, my concerns, my welfare and then only secondarily somebody else. But in this very early rabbinic story here, Abraham then rushes out to welcome the stranger. He doesn't know them. There's no sense of personal gain. Oh, I better welcome them because they can be an advantage to me. None of that selfishness. Complete unknown stranger. And they come and they enter Abraham's tent. Now notice this, the other thing which is extraordinarily interesting. Abraham gives up the conversation with God to meet the stranger. Now, it, it put yourself in that situation. As God has come to comfort you in your misery, and you're having a conversation, and all of a sudden you get up, you leave, and left, leave God standing there. 
that is not without meaning. And the ancient rabbis interpret that to say that even for God, God is willing to say hospitality is more important at the moment than our conversation. Now, if that's not counterintuitive, I don't know. I mean, our, 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 obviously, our intuition would say anything that takes away from conversation with God would be lesser. But in this marvelous rabbinic story, it shows how important hospitality is in God's eyes. Because when you welcome the stranger, as the scriptures will tell us, you may be entertaining angels in disguise. Now, I have often thought in my life that sometimes when somebody appears out of the blue or a situation, uh, you wonder who and what that person is. I remember, and I've told this in another academy, you may have heard the story, may not have, when I was in another parish, it was in a suburb, and there was a big picture window there by the front door, and it was a wintry, blowy, blustery, I hate to even remember that because that's coming around the corner as our days are lengthening. It was a blustery cold day and all of a sudden, it was about five o'clock in the afternoon and all of a sudden on the door and I look out and the snow is swirling and so on. I can't even see who it is. So I opened the door and here was uh, somebody, a stranger, that had come and he said, would you mind if I come in just to get warmed up. Now that's interesting in itself. It wasn't, you know, can you give me five bucks, my car's broken down or whatever. Can I just get warmed up? And I said, well, absolutely. And so I shut the door and boom, shut the door. And I said, can I fix you a cup of coffee, something to eat? Oh no, that's okay, I don't want to be a, a burden. Uh, he didn't have a coat that was significant, sort of a, just a light fall jacket pullover, but not a winter coat by any means. So I sat him down and, and we had some, I often ate lunch there at the parish and I had those cup of soups, you know what those are, the camel cup of soup. I said, how about if I make you some, oh no, I, you know, I, I'll be, just let me warm up just a few seconds and then I'll be on my way. And I said, well, it, I, you know, how about, how about if I have one with you? And he said, well, if you're gonna fix one for yourself, maybe I'll have one. So I fixed two chicken noodle a cup of soups. And I sat down with this person, never saw him before, don't know anything about him, what or where or what the circumstances were, anything. And we sat down and, and he ate the soup and we had a little conversation about how he was, he was going through on his way to visit some relative someplace and you know he had he'd sought the church from the highway and the cross and all that and so you know not not nothing really specific so we had the soup and he said well I better get on my way and I said well you're welcome to stay as long and I said can I take you someplace you know that's obvious no 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 he said I just I'm, I'm on my way I'll be okay and I said well you need a coat or something, and, and I said, and we had a rummage sale or, you know, one of those places, and there had been a coat sitting there for a long time, so I went and got the coat, put it on him, and he said, you wouldn't accept it, oh yeah, you know, finally he did, and I said, well, how about some gloves, I think I might have some gloves in the back, I didn't, but I made it sound like it did, and I took my own gloves and gave it to him. So I said, oh gee, I found some gloves, <laughs> and I gave it to him, and so then, but he wouldn't allow me to drive him any place. And so I opened the door and the wind, you know, you know, I barely can open the wind, the door because the wind's pushing against the door. And I said, well, I can't, I, you know, do you, do you need a place to stay? No, I'm okay. You know, I, I just couldn't do anything more for him. And I shut the door and I, there's this big picture window by the door and all of a sudden he's gone in a big swirl of, of snow, and I look out, and he's not in sight anywhere. And I can see all the way from the church to the street. 
I opened the door again, I looked all around, he wasn't in the parking lot, nothing, just boom, gone. I've thought about that experience, and I just wonder who that really was. Entertain strangers, lest you may miss entertaining an angel <coughs> in disguise. Now that story has impressed, I mean that really unnerved me in many ways, because I realized how easy it would have been to have missed the chance at that hospitality. I could have thought, oh, I don't dare open the door, you know, it might be somebody, uh, you know, I'm here alone, uh, you, know, I, you know, I don't know who this person is or whatever. You know, you could rationalize all kinds of ways out of that situation. But the interesting thing is he wanted nothing except a warm place just to get warmed up. It's amazing that when something like that occurs, it's worth thinking about. How easy it is sometimes we miss opportunities. And if indeed, as the scriptures tell us, that hospitality even takes precedence over a discussion with God, that was the right thing to do at the right place at the right time. I've often thought and it's been borne out by my experience now over these many years uh, as, as, uh, as a pastor, that whenever you do a mitzvah, meaning a good deed, it comes back a thousandfold. I've seen it, I've lived it, I know it, and it's one of the great things of the teachings of the Bible that says, cast your bread upon the water, it come back a thousandfold. You never know the reward. You certainly don't do it for that purpose because you don't know what the reward is going to be. But I have seen evidences in the parish whereby we are tested in some ways. Like God is saying, okay, you talk a good game, but let's see whether you really live it out. And I have discovered, and I really mean this, that every time we rise to the occasion when we do what is right, when we do what God expects us to do, it will be an enormous blessing in disguise, in numerous ways that only through the years will you see being worked out. I've seen it in parish life, where the parish rises to the occasion, really becomes the church of Jesus Christ, proclaims the right word, lifts people up, establishes hope, and all of a sudden, that parish begins to live as a true family of God. It's amazing, not only personally, but collectively. Comforting hospitality can be done in just simple ways. An elevator operator at the old bank in downtown Youngstown, when the, when the club was on the third floor, we would often go, the business people always had tables. All the, the corporations had tables at the club. And occasionally I'd get invited to go there for lunch. It was kind of a businessmen's rendezvous of the place. Uh, back in those days, the men had the third floor, the women had the second floor. Uh, I didn't get off on the second floor, I got off on the third floor. But, but there was an elevator operator there. The, the time that they, the old Otis's, remember, where he had to run that little thing in the, the car and you know, close the gate? And then, you know, and then stop, and then they'd open the gate, the car would bounce, and you'd try to get it, they'd try to get it, stop, start, stop, until they got it right to the right place, remember that? Because sometimes it would be that far away from the floor, and they had to keep adjusting it, so. I remember that every time I would, the person that operated was always very cheerful. She'd say, good morning, how are you? Such a nice day, it's good to see you. Oh, I haven't seen you for a while, it's good to see you. Hope you have a nice lunch. And she would be just so ingratiating. Most of the people that came on that elevator never responded to her at all. Carrying their briefcases, important attorneys, judges, important people. And they, they simply just came on and, you know, that was her job. She, you know, took them up to the club, and she would always say, have a good day, 
I uh, hope uh, uh, your lunch was good. Look forward to seeing tomorrow. Uh, you know, always a, a banter, but it was always kind of one-sided because a lot of the businessmen were talking about their own things and she was wishing us good days and they were talking about their clients or this or that, sort of ignoring or ignoring it. One day after I had uh, been up there to eat, I went and I was the only one on the elevator. And she came, went down to the main floor and she said, I hope you have a good day. It's so nice to see you again. I don't see you as often as I'd like to. And I said, well, I feel the same way. I said, you know, you are really a bright light uh, for us when we come here to lunch. She said, you know, I've told many people, you are the cheeriest, most upbeat, happy person that I meet. And, and I said, I really want you to know how much that means. In fact, if I had no other, another, no other reason to come to dinner or lunch, I come just to see you and to get you to, and she said, that's the nicest thing anybody has ever said. And with that, she broke out in tears. She said, you know, I've been doing this job for 12 years and very seldom does anybody ever tell me that they appreciate me being here. That's hospitality. A simple thing, just to tell somebody how important it was that you're here. You know, it wasn't any big important thing. I mean, it didn't mean an increase in her salary. It, it, there was no reward, excepting just to say how important people are in our lives and give a little recognition of that. That's hospitality. Notice 11, comforting hospitality. Just letting people know how important they are. I tell our congregation, I said, when you go through the checkout line at Giant Eagle, uh, you know, it doesn't take much to just tell the checkout girl, who's probably been hassled uh, all day by grumpy people, that, you know, I'm, I'm glad I got in this line because I enjoy your smile. Or uh, just yesterday, actually, one of these hospitality things came up. I was buying some light bulbs for the church at, at Ace Hardware, and there was a the guy that was checking me out was a young fellow, and uh, he, you know, he, he, he double, double, wrong one thing, and he, you know, he was kind of uh, nervous and he was so forth. And at the end, there was another cashier came over to help him, and they got the order all mixed up, and they had to start all over, and so on. And and he said, the older gentleman, which was the, probably the supervisor. Uh, he said, uh, this, this young man will help you out with your packages. Uh, by the way, I bought bird seed too, so I had two heavy bags of bird seed and then tried to carry light bulbs in. I said, no, that's okay, I can carry them out. No, 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 that, let, let, the, let the kid carry them out. So he carried them out to the car, and, and I told him, uh, he's, I said, well, thanks so much for bringing this out to the car for me. And he says, oh, no problem. I said, you know, you've, you've really, you've got a nice smile and you're, you're gonna, you really did a good job. He said, this was my first day on the job. And uh, I said to him, I said, you're gonna be really good at what you do. With that, a big smile came up on both sides of his face. And he said, well, that means a lot. This has been kind of a, a down day for me because everybody's been yelling at me all day for what I didn't do right. And I said, don't listen to them, listen to me. You did a great job and you're gonna be really good at what you do. In fact, just to, just to bear that out, I'm gonna come back next week and I'm gonna ask for you as my checkout counter. And he smiled and, he, and then he walked back to Ace Hardware and there was a bounce in his step. Comforting hospitality, easy to do. That leads us to 12. Caring. The most important people in your life are people that care for you and you care for them. Um, I don't know whether you've had this experience, but I certainly have that, that visiting in a nursing home, visiting somebody in the hospital, not only benefits the person there, but benefits you. You walk away feeling that you've done a good deed. See, good deeds make you feel good. 
because good deeds are the work of God. Good things are worth doing. Caring. 13. Repair. The Jewish people talk about their task in life is to repair a broken world. I like that. Wherever you find brokenness, it's your job to be a healer, a remaker, a remolder, a reshaper. That's why many of the Jewish people have such a great concern about justice and the inequalities or in inequities that we find in, in life, where people have been unfairly treated, unfairly taken advantage of. And rather than say, well, that's not my responsibility, you know, um, you make it your responsibility. You make it so that, is there something I can do to remediate a situation of injustice. I'll give you an example. There was a woman that came to this parish from the neighborhood, and she asked to be able to use the telephone. And I said, well, sure, come on in, use the telephone. She says, well, I don't, my telephone was disconnected. And so and I have to, I have to, I have to apply for food stamps or SSI. So she calls the, the welfare department on the phone and so on. Then she hangs up. I said, well, how'd that go? And she said, well, not good. They said, leave your number and I'll call you back. But well, she has no number. So I said, well, that's, uh, so right then, uh, I have to kick into gear, right? To do a mitzvah, to do a good deed. That's the opportunity. I'd, my response, if I had made the response, well, that certainly is unfortunate. Well, why don't you come back some other time when you, you, know, you see my car here? <coughs> that could have been one response, but that certainly wouldn't repair anything or do anything good. So the, the kick-in response then becomes, well, let me see what I can do about that. So I pick up the phone, I get the same thing. So I say, okay, uh, I've got an idea. Uh, let's go down to the office. And so she said, well, I don't have any car, I don't have any, okay. She said, you know, I'm, I just am taking care of my son. I'm a single parent and I'm working at McDonald's. And uh, she says, I don't have any way to get, I said, okay, well, let's, let's just do it. I said, I said, I don't have anything to do. Of course I did. But uh, at that point, that took priority, you know. Uh, I, I could have easily said, well, you know, I've got, I got a lot of paperwork here to do. Uh, I don't have time to mess with this now. Uh, see what you can do, and if you can't find anything, come back, you know, sometime else. But I'm a busy person. I'm very important. You know, I'm, I'm a pastor of this parish, or pastor of this parish. You know, this is a big place we've got a lot on, and, you know, I'm just book solid. I might be able to work in next week. Well, that could be one response, but that certainly wouldn't be God's response. God would hold me responsible for that kind of misjudgment. Okay, the, the right response was, okay, I know I've got a lot to do, but I can just work another couple hours this evening and get it done, because right now, God placed her in my charge. Now think about that. When some situation occurs in your life, you're the one that's there. If we are, as the Lutheran Church in America says, we are God's, you know, God's work, our hands. Well, think about that. That's exactly what we're talking about. So, you know, remember the old expression, let George do it? Mm. Meaning, you know, you just let somebody else do what you should be doing. So, right then was the responsibility for me to kick into gear and meet the situation and try to repair Something that is, so we went down to the, to the office, and of course she's, she was uh, an emo, kind of an emotional wreck anyhow, and her life had disintegrated. I heard the story as we went down of all kinds of issues and so on. She was not capable at that moment of getting into a high-powered discussion with the welfare people about all the innuendos and paperwork and everything else. So I stepped into the gap and said, well, look, 
I'll help her fill out these papers. Okay, we well, have to fill form C, form D, form this. So you have to have this, that, the next thing. I said, wait a minute here. Just tell you know, let's let's get this on gear. In other words, I became her advocate. I didn't know her from a, a hole in the wall, but she appeared at the church. Why did she come to the church? It's really interesting. Maybe she saw the sign of the cross on the top. Maybe she knew that when everything else was said and done, the church was a place of refuge and help. If we're not in the helping business, I don't know what, what business we're in. If the church fails, where else do you turn? To the bar down the street? To the wrecking company? The church has to be that place in which when everything else falls apart, there's where you're restored, repaired. And so repair work is part of our calling as we're walking the way of faith to repair what appears before us. Straighten out, try to straighten out. Do we, are we successful all the time? No. Sometimes we're rejected by the person. Sometimes they don't want help. You can't force your way in. But when somebody appears that needs something, you're the one that's there. And there's where your responsibility is. 14. There is nothing wrong with wrestling with God. The story of Jacob, I think, is very instructive. Jacob is facing his, his test uh, with Esau. You know, that's where there was a you know, family story there. But the point is, is that it says God wrestled, uh, or Jacob wrestled, all night before this reconciliation occurred. Now, the, the Hebrew scholars say that could have been an angel, could have been whatever, but a lot of the authors say he wrestled with God. It's the same thing as when God had, was worked down at Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, this is a very immoral, terribly corrupt place, and God is going to try to reform and, and destroy it so that you know, it can start over. It's just so corrupt and so dis disastrous. And then you notice that then the discussion goes on. Well, God, this is, a, this is not according to your, um, your image. You are a God of justice and mercy. So how can you say that you're just going to sort of just wipe everybody out? Suppose, suppose there's 50 good people there. You mean you're just going to take them out along with all the bad people? Now notice the story, which is really terrific. He said, so God really kind of changes his mind. He said, well, you know, you, you got a point there. Well, let me put it this way. If there are 50, yeah, yeah I, I would agree with you. That would be unjust. I shouldn't do something like that. So then, of course, then the next thing says, well, now God, now let's see. If, if you're willing to save 50, now now suppose there's 45 there. Would, would you still, you know, okay, I'll do it. And you see he works God down, 30, 35, down to 10. So the point of that whole story is that we have a right to, and it isn't insulting to, or it isn't that God is going to be mad at you, if you confront God about how you think and what you believe. God is interested in what you're saying. And in that particular instance, the beauty of that scripture is, is that God was willing not to reject Abraham, or not willing to reject you when you have a beef with God. And, you know, my mother used to say, you know, when I get to heaven, there's a few things I want to ask God. You know, about in, the injustices, or why a baby dies in, in, in childbirth, or, or why somebody, you know, uh, gets out of their car to help somebody and they're run over by a car. I mean, it seems so incredulous. Or as Rabbi Kushner wrote that fabulous book, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? That is a, an eternal question. We can deal with that sometime because we, I do have some insights in that. We've, we've talked about this in other, in other preachings in, in, here at the church. But the point is that there's some things you just can't figure out. 
And what the story here is telling you and other scriptures, do not be afraid of God. Don't consider God as an old meaning. Never consider God as one who has lightning in his hand. Remember that story I told you about that a couple weeks ago about that track that I found, you know, where it had God with lightning going like that and man going like this. That is so, so, uh, you know, so, so antithetical to what God is. God is a God of mercy and justice and kindness. He's the good parent that always wants the best for you. What did Jesus say? I came that you may have life and have it in abundance. Doesn't say I came to give you a rough time. Or it doesn't say, it doesn't say, uh, you make the slightest infraction to tick me off and I'm going to get you. You know, that's not the God that is reflected either in Jesus or in the Holy Scriptures, but a God of mercy, justice, a parent who truly loves you and doesn't wish any evil thing to happen to you. And so, we can confront God directly. And God's a big boy. God knows how to handle it. And God's been there before. So nothing you can bring before God is going to shock him or turn him off or that he's going to resist against you. But God will sit and try to discuss it and between the two of you resolve the issue. 15. Giving and sharing. I'm just going to finish this list just before our break here. I'm beginning to smell popcorn. I don't know whether you are. Too. <laughs> Giving and sharing. One of the greatest gifts that you can do in this walk in faith, this move toward a greater sanctification, more greater purification of the soul, is to be able to be extraordinary, extraordinarily generous. The mark of one who truly knows what God it is walking more and more in God's sight is the person who becomes more and more generous, caring, and giving. We begin, to, we begin life being very selfish. If you notice a baby, it's all about them and their care, and everybody has to cater to that baby's need. Now you have a choice. You can remain a baby forever, expecting everybody to do everything for you, at your command, at your time, and nobody else is important as you, or you can mature to the fact that you then come to be the caregiver rather than the care recipient. Actually, you become both in a way, because when you give, you receive. It's reciprocal. So that the more generous you become, the more it is refining your soul and your outlook. People come to me and they'll say, Pastor, what should I give to the church? I say, that's for you to decide between you and God. Well, what do you mean? I say, give what you think is a gift worthy of thanksgiving for all the blessings that you've received. If you're truly grateful, you will give at the appropriate amount or level. If, on the other hand, when you write the check for your pledge on Sunday morning or Saturday night or whenever you write it, and you begrudge giving it, you say, oh, I should never have decided that I was going to give $50 a week to the church. By golly, you know, I, that, that's way too much. I shouldn't have done that. If you have that kind of attitude, a begrudging attitude, then I say to my people, I don't want the offer. You keep it. Keep it until you grow to the place where you feel that you are responding to God for his blessings. Because if it's given in the wrong spirit, it is not helpful to your soul. When you understand that you can't wait to give back as a sense of appreciation, you are now growing in sanctification in the godly life. What can I do for you? I had a call from a, a young person today that I've known that's had some bather, rad, you know, certain, a lot of reverses in his life financially. And I told this person, I, and over the years, I said, I have your back. 
if ever you get into a financial situation whereby, uh, and I wish I could play it for you on the phone here, uh, it is pathetic. He's crying on the phone and, and says, call me. Um, his, he got into a bad situation with his rent and his utilities and so forth. Uh, maybe he used bad judgment. I'm not, his, I'm not standing in judgment. But I realized at that moment when he was crying on the phone and I called him back that I was his port in the storm and that I have been terribly blessed in my life with good friends, good people, a marvelous church, uh, wonderful opportunities and blessings. How could I begrudge somebody that's at their last leg? So I called him back and I said, now, you know, come down and he's crying and I said, we'll work, we'll work, we will work through this. Now tell me the situation and, and let's see what we'll do. And, and then I told him, because he was, I felt maybe suicidal, actually. And I told him, I said, this is going to work out. I said, I told you, I was always here if you needed something. And I said, that's what St. John's is here for. I said, we're here to be the port in the storm uh, for people. And, and uh, so, uh, he told, I said, well, what do, we, what do you need? What's the circumstance? And so on. I said, okay, uh, don't, I don't want you to, to you know, uh, I, I'll, I'm going to work a solution out. Give me a little bit of time to think about how we're going to do this. But you know what? Together, you and I are going to solve this. And so I said, it'll, it'll resolve itself. So I got realizing what money we needed, what, who to contact, this, that, the next thing. And the point is that I became for that person, St. John's at this case, case, became for that person the point of last hope. Now suppose we had said, oh, we don't, we don't have that kind of money. Uh, we'll give you a voucher for $20 to run up to McDonald's and get something to eat, but we can't, we, we can't cover your rent. I mean, are you kidding me? Look around this place. What has God given us? Look at this marvelous building. You mean we can't do for someone that's at their last legs? We'll work it out. We'll find a way. That's more important than something else we might have intention to do. So we realign our priorities. We said, well, we were going to do this, but, you know, right now we need to do this for this person. So all of a sudden, that plan gets set aside. What do you think God thinks about that? This is supposed to be God's house. This is God's temple. We are God's people. If we fail, who will do it? If not us, who? That's giving and sharing. And finally, in that whole business is forgiveness and restoration. If you do not forgive others, how do you expect God to forgive you? We should be in, that doesn't mean that the wrong wasn't a wrong. Doesn't mean that you weren't unjustly treated. It doesn't mean that somebody didn't wrong you badly. But if you harbor those injuries, you will destroy your own life. Because it will eat at you all the time, and you'll never get over it. Because you're harboring an old injury, maybe years ago. Tragically, I see families, for example, that haven't spoken to their the brother, doesn't speak to their sister. Well, what was it about? Well, I don't know, but I know she was just ridiculous and ignorant. Oh, well, maybe she was. Not arguing that. But what are you going to do about it? Well, I'm not going to speak to her. I'll go to my grave without speaking to her. I said, okay, what's that going to gain? Uh, well, she knows that she's in the wrong. But what's it doing to you? Well, I can't forgive it. I can't forget it. And I said, don't mean you for, to forget it. But you also have to set yourself right. What, what's God going to count... Uh, you to task. First thing God will ask you, 
upon your death is, did you reconcile yourself with your sister? Well, she doesn't deserve it. Oh, yeah? So, the issue of forgiveness and confession is that God has provided a mechanism by which we can clean up our act, unburden our souls, and move on with life. And if you don't do it, you're the one that suffers. And it diminishes you throughout your life. Remember, I had a professor that says, when you point your finger at somebody like that, remember three fingers are pointing back at you. My mom used to say that. <laughs> she was a wise woman. Yeah. <laughs> well, with that, let us uh, conclude this, uh, this lecture and uh, enjoy a little bit of hospitality. Mm -hmm.